Mayam Dadati Smart Dadati Gum. Ma Om Vishnu Badaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutala Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamaya Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaurvani Pacharine Nirvishesna Sundhya Vahari Asyatya Deva Sitarine Panchakalpa Tulu Bishya Kripa Sindhu Nevicha Pakitanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnava Vyo Namaha Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Ramadi Morti Sukala, me a main a Kishtam Nana, Vatara Akaro Bubine Sukinchu Krishna Swayam Samabavat Paramantaman Yo, Bubin the Madi Purusham Tamaham Jami. Today is the most uh, glorious and illustrious and most worshipable appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Ramchandra, who's appeared two million years ago, according to Shastra, the Lord appears to annihilate the miscreants, reestablish religious principles, when things become unmanageable by the devakas who are the universal angus of the Lord who manage the universal affairs. When sinful activity reaches such a proportion then the devakas throw up their hands, they cannot manage anymore. Then the Supreme Lord will do something. And in this case, the Lord appeared. Then please his devotees and to enliven his devotees in devotion to himself. <laughs> um, we have been for the last 10 days uh, narrating various sections of the Ramayan which have great meaning and messages for each and every one of us that we can imbibe and uh, adopt in our practice of Krishna consciousness. And so now we are at the day of the appearance of the Lord. It's most glorious around the world. Temples are celebrating. Various functions are in, the, in progress. For instance, where we are here, uh, there will be a Abhishek for Sitaram Lakshman Hanuman coming up very soon. And uh, I'm scheduled to give a class later on this evening here at uh, the Ljubljana Temple in Slovenia. But uh, this is one of many places around the world. Uh, we, Srila Prabhupada, uh, emphasize the worship of Ram as he spoke about his appearance many times during his short stay with us and how important it is to, to understand this particular manifestation of the Lord and uh, glorify the Lord or simply by glorifying the Lord and serving the Lord in the mood of glorification we, we purify our heart and we are develop our attraction for the Lord the whole process of devotional service centers around increasing our attraction for the Lord, which will increase our enthusiasm to serve the Lord and our, uh, our knowledge of the nature of the Lord. The more we know about the Lord, the more we develop our, our loving relationship with the Lord. So hearing these pastimes of the Lord are the epitome, or you might say the pinnacle for the highest principle of spiritual practice. It awakens devotion into the heart, uh, enchants the mind with wonderful 
uh, qualities that the Lord exhibits and teaches us, many important principles that we can adopt on our in our practice of devotional service. So um, I will today uh, try to narrate the final scene of the Ramayana. That is before they, everyone returned to Ayodhya after the 14 years. We talked about how Sita was abducted by Ravana in a disguise and was taken away to Lanka. And then uh, Ram's alliance with the monkey soldiers headed by Sugriva and Hanuman. And now after determining where Sita was, which was 800 miles across the ocean in an island called Lanka, uh, a golden fortress that was created by the demon Ravana. Uh, the monkey soldiers under the guidance of Sri Ram constructed a bridge across the ocean, which was 800 miles long and eight miles wide. The bridge was made out of stone. Uh, some people think, mistakenly think, that this is all mythology, nice stories. And uh, even if they believe it, they believe part of it, they don't believe all of it. How could a bridge be made out of stone and, and could be put across the ocean seems fantastic. But when the Lord is here, anything is possible. And he engineered the whole thing. And even to this day, they have found, and there's two incidences. That was one that was discovered about 15, 20 years ago. Another that was discovered only about two or three years ago that they found the remnants of the bridge underneath the ocean and the stones they found which made up the bridge were unlike any other stones that they have ever seen in existence before. And by carbon dating, they understood that these stones were actually millions of years old. So, um, even the scientists and today's plan makers have discovered remnants of the bridge that was constructed by um, Ram and the monkeys. Now, now they cross the bridge and uh, they're about to attack Lanka. The forces of Lanka have already been, already been uh, warned uh, tomorrow, I'll begin a series of lectures, maybe not tomorrow because of our, our relationship with other sanghas. Tomorrow is with the Harrisburg and Friday is with Charlotte. But the first chance I get, we'll start talking about the glories of Sri Hanuman because on the 27th of this month, which is in six days away is the appearance of Sri Hanumanji. So his appearance follows six days after the appearance of Lord Ram. And there are many wonderful, wonderful, wonderful pastimes of Hanuman, who he actually is and his heroic deeds in assisting the Supreme Lord in rescuing the goddess of fortune Sita Devi. So I'll skip that part where they where Hanuman goes across the ocean, finds Sita, gives her assurance about Ram, and then I'll narrate that particular pastime in the upcoming days. Today we'll um, focus on now that the armies are all lined up, they, they come, and now Ravana, he's alerted that there is a massive, huge, gigantic, uncountable army of hundreds and millions of monkeys 
who are very powerful in form have descended upon Lanka and are surrounding the city of Lanka. And they are led by two human beings, Lakshman and Hanuman, I mean Lakshman and Ram. And now the battle starts to begin. As we hear the narrations of the battle and the fighting that ensued up until the battle of Ram and Ravana, which was the final battle of the fray. Uh, when you read the Ramayan, it's described in detail, the different battle scenes and how it presents itself. The army of Ravana, they were Rakshasas. Rakshasas is a superior race over human beings. And that was the reason why when receiving benedictions from um, Lord Brahma, uh, when Ravana had asked for, you know, immortality away from all types of people, he didn't accept it from human beings because he was thinking human beings are so puny compared to the Rakshasha race, they are just insignificant insects. <laughs> the Rakshasas are very powerful. There is a planet of the Rakshasas that hovers not too far from the earth, but within the vicinity of the earth's region, maybe a few hundred million miles away, but not very far. Uh, so these Rakshasas, are powerful fighters, and so they had they were equipped with all kinds of weapons and various types of swords, bludgeons, clubs, axes, and various sharpened instruments. Uh, they were mounted on elephants, horses, and uh, various types of uh, powerful animals. And uh, their fighting prowess was exemplary. Ravana had created an army of Rakshastras who were undefeatable in battle. Many of his assistants had, had battled against the demigods themselves. His son, Atikaya, had defeated even Varuna in battle and other prominent demigods in battle. His son, Indrajit, who was given the name Indrajit, one who, con one who conquers Indra, even defeated the king of heaven himself, Indra. So Ravana had, Ravana had quite an arsenal of military and his numbers were also hundreds and hundreds and millions of Rakshashas. Uh, now it's clear there will be a big war. Ram is determined to get Sita back. And after being notified by Hanuman of the fortress and crossing the ocean, now these monkeys, they were powerful monkeys such as Sugriva and his son Angada and uh, Nila, Jambavan, and many of the other monkey generals. Their only weapons were rocks, mountain peaks, trees, stuff they could uproot from the environment. And they used them as weapons against the Rakshashas. Empowered by the presence of Ram, they stood ready for battle. Uh, those of you who like, who enjoy the war scenes when the Lord is fighting with the demons or with the opponents, 
will find this particular battle quite amazing, <laughs> interesting, and uh, unmatched in any other description of any of the Lord's uh, encounters with demoniac forces. One by one, Ravana was sending his generals into battle. And as they were fighting, the monkey soldiers were victorious, killing all these generals. Finally, one set of generals, along with many hundreds and thousands of Rakshasas were being killed. Of course, the battle scene is quite intense. You see, as they described the battle, the bodies were strewn all over the, the battleground, so much so that it was even impossible for the soldiers to continue fighting. They were, they were knee deep, sometimes in blood and mangled bodies. It was a ferocious war <laughs> where the monkeys were smashing down on the Rakshashas with trees and rocks, mountain peats, and beating them with their fists and kicking them with their legs. Uh, is a, uh, and uh, Ravana was getting reports. And as his different groups of generals were no longer returning, he was becoming concerned. And each time he would send out another group of generals who were even more powerful and more chivalrous. And all of them were all very much loyal to Ravana. And the fight goes on. In the battle, at one point, Ravana started to realize the formidable power of his enemy. He was thinking that Ram was just a mere human being who had some some exceptional powers, but he underestimated who Ram was actually and who and how his powerful army was equipped with all the, all the power of Ram himself so they could fight against these Rakshashas. After being defeated one after another, of course, there were certain times when many of the monkey soldiers were being destroyed also, and hundreds of thousands of monkeys were also being killed during the fight. So it was a unbelievable battle. It uh, cannot be fully uh, described in detail unless you read it in a story form, then you get a little bit of a insight of the horrific battle that went on both armies fighting with to their capacity and both armies eager for victory. <laughs> um, at one point, Ravana became more and more mortified seeing his generals and their armies being crushed by the monkey soldiers headed by Sugriva, Anuman and others. So he decided that this is the work for his brother, Kubukarna. Kubukarna was a personality that was given the benediction. When he went before Lord Brahma to receive a benediction, we had described this earlier how when he stood before Brahma and he was about to speak what he wanted, uh, the demigods had arranged for the Saraswati to come and speak and take over his voice and he, she did and he spoke that he wanted to sleep. When Ravana heard that, he was aghast that his brother was given the benediction to sleep. He protested and Brahma said we can modify that benediction by he can one day a year, he can come and he can uh, stay awake for a day, day and he can eat whatever he wants to eat. Now he's asleep, he's been asleep not too long. 
In fact, so the benediction is meant to carry on for many more months before he's actually, his time to awaken. The Ravana sends his armies to awaken Vibhishan. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Kubrakarna. Kubrakarna is a monster. He's huge. There was no one as big as Kubrakarna anywhere in that area at the time. With When he was standing inside the city of Lanka, he towered over the walls. He was so huge. He was like, <laughs> like some colossal giant that had appeared. The monkeys, I'm um, sorry, not the monkeys, but the, uh, the Rakshasha shoulders decided to wake him up. So they blew horns, conch shells, beat drums, and did so many things to wake him up, but he didn't wake up. <laughs> Finally, they increased and they started to uh, beat him with clubs. He still didn't wake up. They set, a, they set outside him all kinds of foodstuffs for him to eat, such as meat, various types of intoxications, and big giant pails of blood. <laughs> And then they continued. They rode chariots over his body. They did everything to somehow or other wake him up. Finally, he moved a little bit. <laughs> he finally woke up and then he took advantage of all the food that they had given him and he ate it. And then he went before his brother, Ravana. Ravana explained the situation. Uh, Kubakarna was a little critical of Ravana, saying that, you know, you have been warned by many of us that you are, you're a fool to have stolen the, the consort of Ram, and now you find yourself in this dilemma. So he chastised his brother. Ravana didn't say anything, but he wasn't so interested in being chastised at the same time. Finally, he said, but I need your help. So go and destroy the monkey army. And so he came out of the city. <laughs> when he came out of the city, it was horrendous. <laughs> When the monkey soldiers saw that, this powerful, huge monster coming out of, out of the city, they ran. <laughs> they ran. They, they didn't know which way to go. They, tens of thousands of monkeys were running this way and that way. Uh, the monkey generals headed by Sugriva, Angara, and some of them, and Hanuman were trying to organize the monkeys. Uh, even Babishan, when he saw, he said, the monkeys are so scared, they will not even fight. You should tell them it's only a mechanical device that is on the battlefield. But Ram didn't go along with all of that. I, I didn't. So he came out and he was also surrounded by men and generals. I'll read something. As the, as the monkeys ran away, Angara called out, have you forgotten your prowess, your valor and your lineage? Why are you fleeing like ordinary monkeys? This gigantic nightmare of a Rakshasa will not be able to stand long against us. Protected we are by Ram and Lakshman. Stand and fight, O Varnas. Monkeys regain confidence upon hearing Angada's word. Turning back and holding trees and rocks, they stood firm as Kubukarna rushed towards them. They smashed the Rakshasa with mountain peaks and fully grown trees, but none of these had any effect whatsoever. Each of these things fell to the ground, broken in pieces. Kubukarna was so big, he was scooping up hundreds of monkeys with his hands and ferociously 
consuming them, eating, putting them in his mouth. Monkeys were coming out of his ears and out of his eyes. The monkeys saw what was happening again. They scrambled, ran, and turned. Again, Angada tried to rally the monkeys. Come back. Where will you hide from this monster? <laughs> Although he tried in so many ways, they continued to flee. And then again, he managed to rally them. With Angada at the head of the Varna for forces, they again faced the mighty Rakshasra. Thousands of monkeys rushed into the body of Kunukuna, but he swept them away aside with his huge iron pike, which he was using for battle. And then there's a fight between Hanuman and Kubukarna, and that battle is really amazing. Look, Kubukarna looked like death incarnate, appearing to destroy all living beings. The, the, the Rakshasha laughed, I know you monkey, you are the grandson of Brahma and the son of Riksaraj, speaking to Hanuman. Who became maddened and he stormed again, spinning around. The, and then there's a fight between Sugriva and finally the battle continues. Then Lakshman appeared before the Rakshasha. He immediately two shot two dozen flaming arrows into Kupakarma's arms. The prince continued releasing arrows which covered Kupakarna on all sides. He was impressed by the prowess of Lakshmi. He, Lakshman. He said, Kupakarna, you have shown me your prowess, O prince. I'm impressed by your valor. Even Indra Yamaraj would not dare face me in such an encounter. But I wish only to fight with Ram. Where is your brother? Ram heard the Rakshasha's haughty challenge. Stand ready for battle, he shot back. Ubakana rushed towards him, and then there was a mighty battle, and the battle is described in detail. Kubakana. Then Ram shot a volley of arrows and into the demon's body, blood poured from his wounds like streams of them, like streams coming from a mountain. Kubakan ran, Kubakana ran in fury, crushing monkeys and demons alike. He seized hold of a huge rock and flung it at Ram. Thousands of monkeys rushed at Kubakana and leapt to him, tried to drag him down, but the Rakshasha simply brushed them off like insects. He dashed about, intoxicated with battle and slaying both. This time, Ram was determined to kill him. Ram at once released arrows which flew spits like the speed of lightning. Those arrows which had formerly pierced the seven sal trees, did not even shake the demon in the slightest. Ram released another arrow, which was imbued by the force of the wind god Fayu. It roared through the, and severed the Rakshasa's arm. That arm, which was club, clutching his club, fell to the earth. The Rakshasa shrieked in pain. Ram released another missile, cutting off the Rakshasa's other arm. Still, he was not disturbed, deterred. The Rakshasa still hung swiftly towards the prince. With his mouth wide open, he was emitted in savage, deafening cries which shook the entire universe. This is amazing. Finally, Empowered by the force of a Brahmastra, he released it for Kubukarna's destruction. As it flew towards him with terrible speed, it blazed like a comet descending on earth. It tore off the Rakshasa's head, which looked like a peak of the Himalayan mountain. Adorned with a pair of blazing gold earrings, his head shone as it was carried through the air by the force of Brahma's weapon. 
And then it fell in the defense wall on Lanka and destroyed the massive gate itself. The head then rolled along the royal highway. By the power of Brahma's mystic missile, the Rakshasa's body was lifted and thrown into the ocean, creating a tidal wave which swept the coast of Lanka. Kubakarna was killed. And now the word got back to Ravana. He is mortified. His dear brother, who was invincible in battle, was destroyed. He's starting to think, who are these powerful soldiers? He still underestimates the, the position and power of Ram. And then finally he sends his dear brother Indrajit. Indrajit was a mystic. And he came out of the city fully equipped on his chariot, ready for fighting. He's battling with Hanuman. He's battling with Angada, Sugriva. And... He's fighting in so many ways, but now he decides to become invisible. And so he turns himself invisible and starts fighting from the heavens and no one can see him, but they can see where his, his weapons are coming from so that are all fighting in that direction. He's resorting to sorcery and trickery. At one point, he shot his famous uh, uh, Agnea West uh, weapon, which was a powerful weapon that um, would emit snakes. They were, it was a snake weapon. And these snakes came and coiled around the body of Ram and Lakshman. And both of them were tied up, hands and feet, and could not move. It seems like they were defeated. And then Indrajit retreated, telling that now they are defeated. In fact, he reported that they were also killed. But then, of course, um, the monkeys came, headed by um, Jambavan. And Jambavan released, he had the power to release these snake weapons. <laughs> and then of course, Indrajit returns to the battlefield, renewed in fighting. And then there's a huge battle that goes on. At one point, uh, Lakshman was wounded by the javelin of, uh, of Indrajit. And it looked like he was losing his life. He was unconscious. Ram ran over to his brother feeling that his dear brother was no longer, and Ram, Ram was lamenting. At that time, again, uh, Jambavan came and said, actually, in the Himalayas, many, many thousands of miles away, there is a mountain there. This mountain is protected by the gods, and on the mountain there are four herbs. These herbs, can heal bones, heal wounds, bring a dead back to life. So um, Hanuman, you have the power of Vayu, go and bring these herbs back. So Hanuman flew rapidly. When he got into the area of the mountain, he found the mountain, but the mountain, the herbs on the mountain were fearful seeing this powerful monkey coming so they hid within the soil and didn't reveal himself the Hanuman was trying to find the herbs but he could not find the herbs so he decided to carry the whole mountain back which he did so Hanuman is famous for that and you see many pictures displaying Hanuman flying through the air carrying this huge mountain these mountains are equipped with many herbs and these herbs could, were actually life retrieving herbs, very powerful. These herbs are not something fictitious. These herbs actually exist. Um, when I was uh, visiting one area in Maharashtra, the area was called Satara. Satara is in Maharashtra. I think it's a little bit south of Pune. 
for those of you who are familiar with that area. There was one mountain there, Satara actually means seven hills. So you'll see in the area, there are seven mountains. And the biggest of all mountain, on that mountain there is very sacred herbs, which the Kavirajas, even today, go to make their medicines from. The story is that when Hanuman was flying back with the mountain, the mountain was so huge that at one point, due to the speed of the wind, the top of the mountain broke off and fell in that area and became one of the seven hills of Satara. Uh, when you go, you can see that mountain. It's interesting because it looks like a very mystical mountain from a distance. It's like something that is coming. It's, you're not sure it's there, but it is there because it's mystical in its appearance. So um, that mountain is still there. It's a hill now, but it, it was the top of the uh, mountain. Hanuman returns. Shushena, who is the Kaviraj of the, the uh, Vanaras, he extracts the, uh, the uh, Sanjivani Karana, Karani. There is four herbs. One is called Sanjivani Karani. And that one can bring a body back to life. So using his powers, he made the herbs from the mountains. So he made medicines from the herbs and brought it to Lakshman. And Lakshman was again revived and ready for battle. Now Interjit, he goes back and he's about to perform a sacrifice. This sacrifice was a very special sacrifice that if he performed this sacrifice, then no one could kill him. It's impossible to kill him. He would be invincible to, to gods and everyone in existence. He was performing this sacrifice. So Bibishan warned Ram that he is performing the sacrifice now. You must attack Indrajit and stop him before he completes the sacrifice. If he does, no one will be able to destroy him. So they, the armies, along with Ram and Lakshman, they uh, attacked and this forced Indrajit to stop his sacrifice. He had not completed it and came out again on his chariot for more battles. And finally, of course, it was uh, shown that in the fight, Ram told Indrajit, you know, he, you're a coward, you're hiding, you're using your sorcery. Appear to me in your form and let us fight face to face. <laughs> and so Indrajit, being a noble Shastriya, Kshatriya spirit took up the battle and they fought. And of course, uh, eventually um, Lakshman was the one who had killed Indrajit when Ravana found out that his own brother injured that the powerful person who had defeated the king of heaven injured himself in battle was now no longer. R Ravana, when he was hearing the reports of how his generals were being defeated, he was becoming more and more mortified. But when he heard his, uh, his son injured it, was killed, he, he, uh, uh, he was besides himself in anguish. <laughs> in fact, he started to roll on the floor and he was just like... So one, finally, another group of generals, the last group of generals, four of his sons, uh, Nirantaha, Nirantaka, and Atikaya, and Mahodara, all of these sons of Ravana came out and it was another fierce battle. And eventually Hanuman and the monkeys destroyed them. When you read these, this battle scene, you think, my God, there's nothing like this could ever be possible. But it's amazing how this fight went on. Uh, and, you know, Prabhupada said that, and he said it many times, that there 
was an eternal battle between the forces of righteousness and goodness and the forces of forces the forces of evil he said it is going on even today he said the present in present our world is becoming more and more filled up with demons and the demons are out to exploit the saintly persons along with the material energy that the earth can supply so these uh, accounts of the Lord fighting on behalf of righteousness against evil forces is a continuous struggle between these two forces, the forces of good and the forces of evil. The forces of selfishness, greed, lust, anger, pride, illusion, and envy against the forces of devotion, compassion, and righteousness. These two powerful forces represented by the demigods and the demons are always combating each other on some place within the universe. And when there is no combat, the demons use other forms in order to <coughs> influence their power in different ways. It's going on today. <laughs> it's not something that we read in the past and it's like none of this happens because the Shastras explain that this battle between the forces of good and evil is an eternal battle. As long as there is a material world, these battles will continue to, to rise and disappear, disappear from time to time. Prabhupada also said that the next war that will happen on earth will be between the demons and the demons. The demons will fight each other and they will, they will become powerful by the will of the Lord and their forces will become so powerful. You can see just like now the world is overburdened with military forces as it was when Krishna came 5,000 years ago. Now, so many countries have nuclear weapons, atomic bombs, and various types. You know, mostly all the major countries spend all of their uh, resources on armaments and various types of weapons and training military. This is everywhere in the world. So there's always a chance that these things will explode at any time, given the particular situation. But the devotees are protected by the Lord. So the devotees don't have any anxiety. Their only anxiety is how to save the conditioned souls from being uh, exploited by the influence of irreligion and demoniac influences in the world. And bringing them, of course, to Krishna consciousness. Finally, uh, <laughs> there's nothing left of Ravana. He has a few hundred, 100,000 Rakshashas left. Uh, mostly all of his armies have been destroyed. There's carnage on both sides. And now, after hearing about the death of his son, Indrajit, first he laments, and then he goes into a rage, and he takes out his sword, and he's heading for the Ashoka Grove. He's going to kill Mother Sita thinking that because of her, this is happening. He's on his way, he's determined. Sita sees this demon appearing, red, his eyes bloody red with anger. She shrieks in fear and he's approaching her. Finally, one of his ministers, I can't remember his name. I think his name was Mahas, Mahapaka, something like that. He stands in front of Ravana between him and, she, and Sita. And he says, my dear uh, King, what value will you get by killing this innocent woman? She is sinless. Simply, you're, she is not your enemy. Your enemy is there on the battlefield. This is where you should put your energy. Do not kill an innocent woman. You will be known and you will be criticized for, the, for eternity for this act of cruelty, unnecessary cruelty. So Ravana, he listens and he is influenced. So he, he agrees 
he turns away from Sita, and now he rallies the remaining parts of his armies. He steps onto his own chariot, and he's about to enter into the battle. And the final battle between Ram and Ravana is the most amazing fight. <laughs> uh, Ravana was cutting through the armies of the monkeys like they weren't even existing. Nobody was even, even the major monkey generals. But Ravana was wanting to battle with Ram. Even when Lakshman came, he pushed Lakshman aside. He said, I want to fight with Ram. So then there is a, a tremendous battle with both releasing vol volumes of weapons that's described in detail, the nature of these weapons and how fierce the fa fighting went on. The fighting went on for days, both never tiring. And Ram could not defeat this Rakshasha and the Rakshasha could not in any way harm Ram. Ram was thinking how to kill this Finally, Vibhishan told him that you remember, you know, uh, there is a particular prayer called Aditya Riddaya, Riddaya. You recite this prayer. This prayer was given to you by Lord Brahma himself. And this prayer is so powerful that you will be able to invoke celestial weapons, which will destroy this demon. So he did that. And then he was equipped with more and more powerful weapons. But even in then, uh, Ravana was expert. He was an expert fighter. And at one point, Ram was getting the upper hand and he was cutting off the heads because Ravana was known as Dasagriya, Dasagriva. He had 10 heads. And although Ram was firing these powerful weapons and destroying the heads of uh, Ravana, his heads were coming back one after another. <laughs> and Ravana could, could not be killed. Finally, Vibhishan said, do you remember? Augusta Muni had given you that celestial arrow. That arrow has been dipped in, in, in the, the nectar of immortality. That arrow is invincible. So Ram chanted the mantra and the, ra and, the, and the arrow appeared onto his bow. And this, this arrow was like a Brahmastra weapon. And then Vibhishan said, because he has an in, inexhaustible uh, uh, supply of nectar within his heart, he cannot be killed in any other way. You have to shoot him in the heart. So Ram now is ready. The battle is going on. He chants the mantras. The arrow appears. The mantra by Augusta Muni. When the guru gives the weapon, then the disciple can overcome any force of maya. So he pulls it back. When he pulls it back, the whole earth shakes. Monkeys and demons were falling over by the force of the Ram pulling back on that arrow. And when he released that arrow, that arrow was like a blazing meteor. It went so fast that Ra Ravana couldn't even detect that it was coming. It came so fast. It entered into the body of Ravana, went through his heart, came out the other side, and went into the earth. And the, the arrow was soaked with the blood of Ravana, and Ravana was no longer. When, that, when, when the Rakshasas saw that their leader was dead, there was no need to fight, they all ran. And shouts of victory and joy came from the monkey armies. And then, of course, Mandodari, the principal queen, when she heard that her husband had been killed, she came out onto the battlefield and she lamented the death of her husband. And then there's a, there's a scene where she's, while she's lamenting and wailing the departure of her husband, She's also chastising him 
for his foolishness in trying to steal the wife of a, another man. <laughs> and so now Ram is victorious. <laughs> so Ram then goes and after that he coronates Vibhishan, puts him on the throne of the Rakshasas. The Rakshasas are happy to have Vibhishan as their king. He's going to rule the Rakshasas. And then Ram turns to Hanuman, tells Sita that she should prepare herself and give her the news. Sita wasn't aware of, of the victory. Hanuman came. She was happy to see Hanuman. He explains how Ram has been victorious. Vibhishan was on the throne. Ravana was dead. The Lord is asking you to come back and meet him. He is eager for your uh, darshan. She's overwhelmed with joy. She wants to come immediately. Her heart is so afflicted with so much happiness. She can't hold back her tears of joy. She wants to reward Hanuman in so many ways. And she starts glorifying Hanuman, offering beautiful, beautiful mantras, glorifying Hanuman. And she said, if I had the gifts that I want to give you, I would give you so many gifts, but I have nothing here. <laughs> so in so many ways. Now Hanuman looks and sees these Rakshashis who are standing not too far away from Sita. They were the ones that were guarding Sita. And they had harassed Sita during that ordeal of being captured by Ravana for practically a year. And then Hanuman wanted to uh, take revenge against these Rakshashis, these uh, female Rakshashas. But Sita, she, she said, no, actually, they are innocent. They were only working under the guise of, and a person who is righteous does not punish the enemy when there's no need to. So therefore, uh, we should allow them to go on with their life and they are innocent. And so she speaks in so many glorious ways. The nature of a compassionate person, although harassed ourselves by these persons. She didn't want to them to suffer. Hanuman listens to Sita glorifying the principles of righteousness and forgiveness. He bows his head in front of uh, Sita with his hands folded. And then he, she continues to glorify him. Finally, he says, you must prepare yourself now to meet Ram. Now, everyone goes back to Ram. Ram is in an interesting mood. Sita wanted to come immediately, but Ram sent the message that no, she should be bathed in nice unguents and herbs, dress nicely in beautiful garments, and then she, could, she should come. Ram's mood changed. He was very, very grave. He looked like he was very pensive in his mood. He was thinking deeply, showing no signs of happiness externally. Finally, Sita came. And when she saw him, she was so happy. But Ram looked at her. And Ram was thinking, if I accept her back, I will be criticized. She was with another man for almost a year. What will they say about me? I'm accepting my wife back after she's been with another man for such a long time. I will be criticized. I will be vilified. My reputation as a leader will no longer be accepted. So he said to her, I have come, I have rescued you, but now you may go wherever you wanna go. I have no more business with you. My God, when she heard that, she practically died on the spot. She responded in so many ways to her, what he said, that not even for a moment, not even for a second, that I even consider looking at another man. My heart was always dedicated 
to you. In so many ways, she spoke, she extolled her chastity. Ram was not moved at all. He, he remained grave and silent. Then she understood that he was not going to change. She said, all right, I cannot live without you. If I cannot live with you, I cannot live without you. So she signaled to, I forgot who it was, that to build a funeral pyre. And then Ram looked at Lakshman and said, build a funeral pyre. And so they got some logs. Lakshman didn't like what he was doing, but he carried out his brother's instructions. A fire was lit. Sita turned, offered her, her obeisances to her dear husband, Ram, turned and without the slightest bit of fear entered into the fire and she was gone. When everyone saw that, everyone was watching, they sent out a gasp of horror, amazement. Everyone was shocked. After some time, the fire died down and out of the fire came Agni carrying Sita and he placed her in front of Ram. She is chaste, pure, her mind not even for one second has deviated from your lotus feet during that whole time. Please accept her back. Ram was very happy and he immediately accepted her, her back. And then of course, after that, they left to return to Ayodhya. So Ram tested Sita in such a way that it seemed like he was again becoming unfair, but this time it proved the chastity of Sita. Sita, the real Sita, the goddess of fortune was never touched. There's one pastime in Lord Chaitanya's Leelas where Lord Chaitanya was traveling in South India. He came to the house of one Brahmin who was a Ram Bhakta. The Ram Bhakta offered to offer a meal to Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya said, I will be back. So please prepare. So the Lord appeared again after a couple hours, but the Brahmin didn't even cook. He said, you had invited me and you were preparing to cook, but I can see nothing has happened. He said, yes, when I think how this terrible demon Ravana had captured the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, Sita Devi, I'm overwhelmed with lamentation. My heart breaks. I cannot even function. The Lord understood the heart of this Brahman and he left and he came back with one scripture describing how the real Sita was never taken by Ravana. It was a Maya Sita who was taken by Ravana, not the real Sita, the real goddess of fortune. And this is an interesting principle of spiritual knowledge that we should understand that the demons cannot touch transcendence. Transcendence is above the material energy and the demons are within the control of the material energy. So the demons cannot touch transcendence, although they may appear to, they are, they, they are uh, unable to affect anyone who is on the transcendental platform. That, mean, that doesn't mean in the mode of goodness, that means on suicide complete transcendence. When that Brahman heard about that, he became joyful, and then he prepared a wonderful meal for Lord Chaitanya. So um, Ram wanted to prove to the world he, that the chastity of Sita was glorious, although being captivated by Ravana, she was never touched in even the slightest way. So I'll stop there because our times are running out. I have to go for another class in about. So we have about a half hour 
If there's any questions or comments on the Ramayana, today is the glorious appearance of Ram in the world. It's a great celebration for devotees to read about, hear about, glorify, remember the Supreme Personality of Godhead as Sri Ramachandra, the perfect husband, the perfect king, and the perfect, uh, what we say, example of pure righteousness in all capacities of activities. Okay, Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj, for this uh, absolutely wonderful narration of this epic battle between Ram and Lakshman and the forces of uh, Ravan, each general coming and how they're getting defeated. It was really so uh, mesmerizing to just hear this uh, wonderful narrative. And also there's so many lessons for us to remember that uh, if we take shelter of the Lord, we will be protected and we do not have to fear evil because he's always there to protect his devotees. So thank you very much for this narration. Uh, we humbly request the devotees to please uh, come forward, ask questions, share your realizations um, or your delight at hearing this beautiful narration. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All goes to Srila Prabhupada. Um, happy Ram Namri to you, Guru Maharaj, and all the assembled devotees. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful narration. Uh, as Sri Devi Mataji said, uh, uh, very nicely narrated today, Guru Maharaj. Um, so Guru Maharaj, please forgive me my ignorance if I'm asking anything wrong. So uh, I, I have a question like, um, in any of the incarnations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, uh, Lakshmi Devi is not uh, suffered so much. She, she is not that much involved in most of the incarnations. But um, but why in this uh, uh, why in this incarnation of Lord Ram and uh, Sita Devi is suffered so much? And, uh, and well, one of the one of the four reasons why the Lord appeared on Earth is not so much revealed. But one of the reasons is that. The goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, in the, in the spiritual world, which is the eternal concept of Narayan, was feeling that I don't get much opportunities to spend time with my Supreme Lord by myself. So she took this opportunity. And that's why when Ram was banished to the forest, uh, Sita wasn't supposed to come to the forest. She could have stayed there. She could have went to her father's kingdom. She could have did so many other things, but she was willing to undergo the hardships of coming into the forest just to be with her husband. And because this was her desire to spend time with him. That, and that's mentioned as one of the reasons why the Lord appeared in this particular manifestation to satisfy Sita's desire to be with him. And she had the opportunity to spend 14 years with him in the forest together. And they shared wonderful pastimes together. And so, yes, in this particular manifestation, she undergoes a lot of tribulations because the forest is not a place for a woman. <laughs> It's not a place for, uh, you know, it's a dangerous place. It's full of various types of dangers. She's a frail lady. She's a queen. She's uh, accustomed to luxury. But she gives up all that just to be with her husband. She teaches the principles of chastity and faithfulness to the husband that despite uh, the difficulties that she would experience, uh, except being with her husband, she, she, she wanted to do that more than being away from him. So in that, she had to undergo so many things. But there's another message. Sita represents the goddess of fortune. And the demons are always trying to get uh, fortune without the source of fortune. In other words, Lakshmi represents Aishwarya or opulence. 
So opulence is there in the energy of the Lord, which manifests itself in different ways. Jewels, pearls, various types of material ornamentations that are sought after by the demoniac persons at any cost. Mm -hmm. Just like now, in the world, you can't buy gold anywhere because the demons have bought up the gold markets and all the gold has been, whatever, whatever was available on the markets are all controlled now by the demons. The demons have all the gold. And people may have some gold rings and some gold jewelry and some gold ornaments here and there, but they're also trying to get that too. So this trying to get Lakshmi or fortune, what, getting the goddess of fortune, her gifts, without getting the person. In other words, if you want the goddess of fortune, you have to take the source of the goddess of fortune along with them. So those who want Sita without Ram will end up like Ravana. So that message is there for everyone and anyone to understand that don't try to enjoy the things of this world separate from the source that is the Lord himself. So for devotees, they know we're interested in, in Krishna. We're not interested in his energy. But there are people who are interested in his energy more than they are in Krishna. And if you cut the energy off of, from the source, then you put yourself in a situation where you'll be dis destroyed in due course of time. <clears throat> and that's what will happen to the demons. So that message was part of this Leela. Mm -hmm. These two things. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. She was willing to undergo that suffering just to be with Ram. Thank you. I saw, I saw a, um, before I answer the next question by Mohi, Mohanasani Radha, someone asked about fasting. Srila Prabhupada said that we should fast to noon. And, other, and Prabhupada also said we should fast to sunrise. In two different occasions, he said different things. And so ultimately, Ram appeared at midday. So most temples are fasting till uh, noon. It's a half a day fast today. There are some temples who are fasting later on like that. So here in Ljubljana, we fasted for a half a day and we took lunch at, uh, at 1 32 o'clock today. So thank you, I think you can follow that with no problem. Today is a half a day fast. Thank you, Garaj. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Mohanasani Radha, what was your question? <laughs> Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, thank you so much. I wanted to know if Rama actually is Krishna and if yes, how many percent? And which kind of uh, incarnation is he actually and which qualities does uh, Lord Rama represent? Well, he's a Narayan manifestation of the Godhead and Narayan has 96% of the qualities of the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna himself. Krishna is the original Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is Adi Purusha. Govindam Adi Purusham Tamaham Bajami. So, Ete Chamsam Kalom Pumsam Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. All the incarnations and manifestations that are plenary portions and portions of the plenary portion. There are numerable manifestations and incarnations of the Lord. And in the Vaikuntha realm, the highest is Sri Ram himself. He represents Vaikuntha in its super excellence. So he carries 96% of the qualities of the Lord like that. Um, 
And what was the second part of your question? Um, which qualities does he represent uh, for us? Yeah, what righteous. can we learn from him? Yeah, righteousness. He was the most righteous, following strictly religious principles. He was the ideal king, ideal husband. These are the two qualities that stand out in his character. He protected all those who took shelter of him. So he represents Dharma? Yeah, he's, he's the personification of Dharma, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I understand. Yeah, yeah. He's the Lord himself. <laughs> Krishna, he acts according to what he wants to do. And no one can imitate Krishna. Therefore, generally, people in general, when they compare Krishna with Ram, they always accept Ram over Krishna because Krishna is too hard to understand. Ram is more easy to understand because he represents all the qualities that we're supposed to follow also. Krishna does whatever he likes, whenever he wants, because he's the Lord. He's the Supreme Lord, the author of morality, the author of spirituality. He is, he is beyond reproach. If he dances with 16,108 queens, if he has, you know, if he says he's gonna do one thing and he does something else, Ram was not, wasn't like that, mm -hmm. but Krishna can do that because Krishna is the Supreme Godhead who is the author of all principles of religion for all times. So it's very difficult to understand Krishna. It's easier to understand and uh, hear about Ram because Ram exemplifies the qualities that we're meant to practice in our Krishna consciousness. You can't imitate Krishna. <laughs> but is he like incarnation from Vishnu Tattva or? Yeah. Ramadi Morti Sukalani Amena Tishtana Navatara Karal Bhuvanesha Kinchu. Krishna Swayam Sama Bhavad Paramam Paman Yo Govinda Mari Purusham Tamaham Bhajami. Out of the, all of the incarnations of the Lord, He is the principal manifestation of the incarnation of the Lord. Mm, okay. Ramadi, Ramadi, Ram, and all the other manifestations they follow like that. Oh, that's why. Okay, okay. Ramadi, not just Ram, Ramadi. Mm -hmm. Thank you for explanation. It's wonderful. It's hard to understand, but yeah. Uh, Guru Maharaj, we have Deepti who has raised her hand, and we have Agni on the chat. Would you like Deepti to go first? Uh, you're the one who chooses, not me. Um, the, you're you're the uh, moderator. You you do the choosing. You moderate. Um, yes, Guru Maharaj. We will ask people who want to speak to come up first. Deepti, please go ahead and ask your question. And please unmute as well as put on your video. Thank you. Okay. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to you. All glory to Sri Prabhupada. Uh, thank you so much for lovely narration of Sri Ram appearance and the, uh, actually the Ra Ram and Ramana fight as well. Uh, I might have missed this point. You might have mentioned in the previous class, but just wanted to check. Um, Ram being a supreme personality of Godhead himself. Why did he take help of the monkeys to fight Ravana? And uh, 
second question is when was sita matta become maya instead of actual lakshmi devi okay uh, the lord always commissions the help of his devotees this like the lord is all powerful he can do everything himself but he always includes his devotees to glorify his devotees this like you know when krishna came he took the help of the pandavas yeah and any incarnation the lord always includes his devotees with him and he empowers his devotees to act on his behalf and the devotees get the credit although the lord is the force behind the success that's how the lord does he's he can do everything in himself there's no problem with that but that's not the way he does things for his for the lord his devotees are most most dear so he wants to glorify his devotees show the power of his devotees and show the dedication that his devotees have towards him to the world therefore the devotees become glorified mm. although it's krishna doing everything <laughs> Mm. He gives credit to his devotees and always includes his devotees. So why did he not ask uh, help from Bharat Maharaj? From who? His brother Bharat. Bharat was left to rule, to stay in place and rule the kingdom there. Lakshman came just to assist his brother and protect Yeah, Ram and Sita while they were in the forest. Mm -hmm. Ram was playing the part of a human being, although he was the supreme lord. So he laments the loss of his wife, mm -hmm. just like a human being. Although Prabhupada said he could have produced so many other Sitas just from his own body. <laughs> But he's playing the part of a human being. Okay. he he laments the death of his father he shows human emotions just like just like the humans do this is his role when he comes okay it's no fun if he's he's the all powerful force if he just comes and does, does everything what's there's no fun in it <laughs> he makes everything exciting by including his devotees in everything true it's happening right now he's empowering the iskon movement to spread krishna consciousness all around the world but great prop said lord chaitanya could do it simply by himself when when lord chaitanya was in india 500 years ago He spread Krishna consciousness all over the entire Indian subcontinent. He traveled from from all the way from Jagannath Puri down to Cape Comoran and back, and he made hundreds of thousands of people chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. He practically spread Krishna consciousness all over India. So one devotee asked Prabhupada, "Is how they got it? Well, if Lord Caitanya was here and he made all of India, why didn't he just?" make the rest of the world krishna conscious and prabhupada simply said he left it for me to do <laughs> the devotees like to act on behalf of the lord that is their pleasure they and the lord wants to glorify his devotees by empowering his devotees to act on his behalf now the second question in regards to Uh, Ravana attacked one mystic lady when she was in the forest she was performing austerities and he wanted to vilify and violate her she was in mystic 
meditation. Ravana entreated her in so many ways to become his consort. She refused. She said, I, I am meditating on Vishnu and my father wants me to marry Vishnu and that's where my heart is. I am praying that Vishnu will become my husband. Mm -hmm. uh, when, uh, mm, when Ravana didn't like that, he tried to force himself on her. So he grabbed her hair, she had long hair. By her mystic power, she produced a sword which cut her hair where Ravana was holding it. And Ravana fell back. And then she chastised him. Because you have touched me, I am no longer pure. Therefore, I, am, I will give up this body. But you should know that your future, you will be destroyed because of a woman. So that same person who was meditating on Vishnu, she was Begavati, and she was the false Sita that Ravana had stolen. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Because Ram only was allowed one wife in that incarnation, mm. she had to appear as the duplicate Sita in order to get the the benediction of being with Ram. Mm -hmm. But the real Sita appeared from the fire later on it, at the end of the battle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all the time in the jungle, Vegapati was there with Rama or uh, Sita Mata was there, but only when Ra Ravana came, Vegapati came in? Only when Ravana kidnapped her. Kidnapped. Because again, Evil cannot touch transcendence. So mm. he didn't capture the real Sita, he captured the Maya Sita. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. You mentioned that, yes. Mm -hmm. And Lord Chaitanya brought out that point also. Same point. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, oh. mm -hmm. Dear Guru Maharaj, Agne as it was uh, Maya Sita, she offers her obeisances and wishes you happy Lord's appearance day. She says, you mentioned real Sita was never kidnapped, it was Maya Sita. So where was the real Sita at that time? Why and where did she hide herself? She, was with, the, she was with the fire god Agni. <laughs> He, she took shelter of Agni's abode. He kept her there until the time when she came out of the fire. <laughs> Is that okay, Agni? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Guru Maharaj, Madhvananda Prabhu has a question. After the fast time is over, do we break the fast with a feast or Ekadashi preparations? Um, different temples do different things. Um, where are you? As, as, who's asking the question? His Grace Madhavananda Prabhu. Madhavananda? Oh, I know where he is. He's in Belgium. Okay. So... Um, Different temples do different things. Uh, it's not required to break the fast with an Akadasi feast. But here in Ljubljana, the tradition is that they do that every year. So today we our lunch was completely Akadasi. So that's the tradition here. But I've been to other temples on this occasion. And my experience is that We've had regular prasadam and a huge feast on this particular day. But you have to break the fast at noon. Is that okay, Madhavananda Prabhu?
We don't have any more questions, Guru Maharaj. Okay, I'm out of time. I have to get to the temple for the next pro for our evening program. So thank Guru you very Maharaj, much. Just one, just one very quick question. For the feast, what, what does Lord Ram like to eat? Um, I've never read anything that there was specially he liked, although there may be something written that I'm not aware of. Just pre prepare everything nicely with devotion. That's sufficient. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll see you all tomorrow um, with the Harrisburg group. And I think our time has to be in line with their time, which is at um, 12 o'clock UK time. So we're going to revert back to the 12 o'clock time for tomorrow, 12 o'clock UK time, 1 o'clock my time for the Harrisburg program tomorrow. For further information and details, contact Lavanya or Tushar to get all the details. Okay, thank you very much. All glories to Sri Ram Sitaram, Lakshman, Hanumanji, Ki Jai. Thank you very much. Happy Lord Ram.